you already know all these things, but just in case, I wanted to make sure you had it in a coherent picture. Um, the first thing that I think is, I, I think it depresses people, to be honest, is that in this, you know, culture, in this community, we do know a lot of the time what we don't know. And we also kind of know what we don't care about. And that's, I think, what frustrates a lot of people. I'll, I'll point out that we still don't know if the government is even looking at this North Korea thing. Uh, I think it's it's pretty funny at this point. It's funny at this point. It was sad last week, but this 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 week it's funny. Um, and apparently they had an IEO day, and most people would say, "Why IE and not Edge or something?" You know, useful. But South Korea is a really particular environment. And until recently, you had to have ActiveX to do anything in South Korea, banking or government stuff or whatever. So, And also, the entire game community is so different there that you have to almost see it to believe it. Uh, a lot of them are like ActiveX games. So uh, anyway, really interesting stuff still happening in this space. I, I, I know there's a lot of presentations on what sorts of techniques they use. There's still a lot we really don't know. We don't know for sure what O'Day there is. There's a new Chrome O'Day that got, I think, announced and patched today uh, that might be related. We don't know yet. So uh, anyway, very, very interesting stuff. This week, I really have three sections. Uh, I, I don't want to make it a recurring section on bad New Yorker articles, but it looks like that might happen. Um, enterprise software security is getting a highlight and then a bunch of stuff you didn't see. Um, so I want to talk about why enterprise product security is such a nightmare. And it's interesting because there's only, you know, a thousand companies that most of the security business worldwide sells to, right? So if you look at like the Fortune 1000, those are the people who have the money to buy a $50,000 piece of equipment or software. And, and we're talking $50,000 is, is the bottom starting price. And these go up to, you know, six figures. So every company you know is trying to hit those same thousand people, which is why it's so fun to be the CISO at any of these companies. Uh, you know, the, the other side of that story, though, is... The default EULA and the way business is done means that you as a company don't get to announce publicly the results of any kind of security work you have done on your product base, anything you buy. And that's most important when you are not the ones doing it. So if you as bankofbobsgiantbank.com buy you know, a giant firewall and then have a small security company look at it, they are not going to be able to publicly say, oh, we found the following set of things in this firewall. And they're also not able to help you proactively or retroactively. They're not able to say, oh, you know what? We're going to go buy one each of all the top firewalls and test them and then announce the results. That is something they legally cannot do. And so that results in a distorted marketplace. And what you won't see in U.S. government is anyone addressing this distortion of any kind. Um, and so the, the, the results are unsurprising to people who've been in this industry doing penetration tests, assessments, incident response, whatever it is. Uh, Chinese hackers using SolarWinds bug. So I think what's confusing here is that this is not the same SolarWinds issue that we were talking about two weeks ago, right? So this is the .NET deserialization bug, I think, which allows you to get remote access to someone who has SolarWinds Orion. And that's the other funny thing is SolarWinds makes a bunch of products and we just now all call them SolarWinds bugs, which is not good. Um, but if you have SolarWinds Orion installed in a place bad people can touch it, then you are doing bad work. I don't know what to say. Uh, other, you know, this is an example Proof of concept code. It's a deserialization bug for in the most part. And I think uh, it's funny because we have a lot of people talking about, you know, memory vulnerabilities. Uh, so if you look at a paper we have a little bit later, we're going to be talking about memory access vulnerabilities. Uh, and when people switch to uh, sort of managed languages, 
that was great for a while until they found the deserialization bug class, which then made all of these products much weaker. Um, and also people got good at logic bugs. People got good at cryptographic bugs. People got good at a bunch of other kinds of bugs. So I think, I mean, we, we sort of do reach for, obviously writing a managed language is better. It's empirically better. It also matters which managed language you pick and how you use it. And, you, you know, a lot of them have made poor design choices that they've, or they've copied them from Java that have made it very difficult to secure big products written in, that, in those languages too. So that's something you can see here. I want to talk a little bit about the Cyberspace Solarium uh, thoughts around fixing market distortions and security. And what they say is like, what if instead we had this new concept, final goods assembler, attached to any finished product, and then uh, they had a liability attached to not patching vulnerabilities. So this is a terrible idea. And it's in the final Cyberspace Solarium paper. I don't think it's one of their top priorities. Um, but I think it's important to note that this idea had a lot of traction at a particular time. And there's so many reasons that it's a terrible idea that like the rest of the community was just could not get a word out of their mouth to discuss why it was such a bad idea. But one of the most obvious ones that has come out is this, which is that Patching is a very confusing topic with security. I, th I recommend everyone reads this paper. But um, she did a talk recently. I think there's a new updated paper on each of the root causes of all the vulnerabilities they looked at. Um, it takes a lot of work. You need a very skilled hacker to look at any vulnerability to say what the root cause is and what the patch should be. And that process really does not scale at, at all. Um, not not to mention well. So it's very interesting. She's like, well, out of out of the four detected Ode, you know, one out of every four is it ha was related to one something we've already looked at, which I think is fascinating. It's just truly fascinating. And if you look at the way modern, like look at the Chromium project, which I still think is one of the better public software products available that you can look at in terms of process. So as, when they find a vulnerability, they also write a fuzzer for that vulnerability. For every vulnerability, it's a fuzzer. It goes through the test engine, and then it maybe pops out more variants. It maybe explores the space a little more. That That is not something that... I mean, even writing the fuzzers properly is really hard. So anyway, very worth doing. I think it's worth talking about, because no one wants to, that static and dynamic, dynamic analysis of applications has the exact same issue. And when when I was part of a consulting firm, we had you know, our customers running into this problem. They're like, you know what, we we like you guys, but you're too expensive. So what if we had a static analysis program that also had dynamic analysis and it would, you know, scan our app and it would pop out vulnerabilities in a big list and we'll just give you the list. And I'm like, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, you get a big list of like, you know, 15 cross-site scriptings and you go through each one and, you know, like has 30% of them are real, which is pretty bad all by itself. But looking at each one also takes you, like all the false positives take you a, a day, it's almost. The, the And there's a chance of false negatives as well, of course. Um, so each vulnerability that you're looking at, I mean, figuring out if it's real or not has not changed. And that's sort of a very big problem with all of the sort of processes we're building is we haven't really looked at some of the processes we're building into security models to make sure that they, in fact, help you. Although, obviously, knowing about the bugs is a good first step. But do you, but you don't really know about the bugs. That's the problem. Is like, I know there might be a bug there. So they really help. They really are offensive tools in that sense, if that makes any sense. So um, the quality of a product is what you're really measuring. And I don't know how to say this in any other way. It's, it's not necessarily, am I measuring their bugs? I'm measuring their quality. And when we see big financials do this right, they have a penetration testing team come in and look at stuff before they deploy it with a clause in the contract that says, if you don't fix it to our liking, we will not buy your product or we get our money back. And what they're really saying is, by the to our liking, is we're measuring the maturity of your security model so that to see if you get upset when we send you a bunch of vulnerabilities and we're also, you know, also measuring how hard it was. So we asked the, the penetration testers, is this 
written to a standard that is okay. And if you'd looked at like the thousands of VPN bugs that came out last week or last year, you would have said most of, the, most of those would not have passed a basic assessment. And there's there's got to be a reason people still bought them. We are not addressing that root reason. One of the things that, one of the papers that came out yesterday, this paper on CVSS, which matches, the reason I, I pasted this screenshot is it really does match the the experience of most penetration testers as they rate vulnerabilities. A lot of them come out like 9.4. Like everyone knows the like five different actual things. So if you think about it, if all vulnerabilities have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight possibilities, let's just make it a scale of one to eight with no decimal point. You know what I mean? Um, make it enumeration from super red, ultraviolet to brown. I don't know what it is. So like make it enumeration and not a score. That is how it is. Sasha is like, oh, I don't know if that's appropriate because he's like, that's not how we built it. He's 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 right actually. Like, there isn't a there is no theoretical distribution. This is I don't actually think this paper states the reality in the, that sense, but I think it states a different reality. So, um, I mean, there's so many confounding factors to the empirical distribution of vulnerabilities, depending on, because we're not looking for tiny vulnerabilities, you know what I mean? We're not even reporting those. Why bother? So obviously you're going to see big skews all over the place. Um, okay, so I, I want to sum this up by saying there's a reason NSS Labs went out of business, and the reason is that we cannot have a company like NSS Labs using current legal frameworks because NSS Labs has to go to everything they test and ask for permission. And then when they publish it, they probably get sued if it's bad, right? So like, if you if you cannot say bad news about a product or publish your own performance indicators, then, uh, then obviously you are not going to have a, a real marketplace and you're going to run into systemic failure. It's not confusing. That is our lack of surprise. This also, I thought was really funny. Like, SolarWinds was like, uh, that we've, we've cleaned up our network. We're all good now. Thank you. Nothing to see here. Um, and then they shot the console or whatever it is. You know, um, I don't, no evidence the actor is still in their networks. If you put a good hacker in your network for eight months and then roll a 1D20 to generate a percentage for whether or not they're going to be able to get back in again, I don't know. You, you may you may find that, that you rolled a 20. It's possible. Anything is possible. Let's talk about The New Yorker. I, I desperately did not want to make this a, a, again. But here's an article. It's a book review of the Nicole Polroth book that's coming out on Tuesday. And I've not read the book. I have read this article. Apparently now I've read two versions of the article. Um, I think... The article, people were like, oh, it's not properly representing the book, but I, I think it actually kind of represents a picture of the book as you would read it if you are not very technical. So in that sense, I think it's very accurate. Um, one of the words that I think has been thrown around on purpose by Microsoft and the Cyber Peace Institute and some of these articles is the word mercenary. I think the word contractor is much more accurate and less crazy. Um, and I think the fact that people are using the word mercenary says what they're kind of trying to do, which is paint everyone with a very broad negative brush. Um, I also think you can say hacker if you are a hacker and just sort of mean part of the community. But when you say hacker in something like this, there, there are differentiations. So a hacker can be an exploit writer. A hacker can be an operator, as we would call it. A hacker can be someone who manages a network that is being used for uh, deploying things or researching things. So it can mean there, there are a lot of different things under that, under that umbrella. And I think it's important, and especially in this case, what that is. Because I don't think in any case, David Evenden, Evenden I don't know him personally, um, sold any zero days to foreign governments. Um, so 
This, this, and also look at the way this, this is constructed as a paragraph, right? Some of those mercenaries are Americans who sell zero days to foreign governments. Did David Evenden? It follows immediately with that statement. Blah, blah, David Evenden was a part of a team. David Evenden, is he a hacker that sold zero days to foreign governments? I don't actually think he did. So this is the corrected version of the article, and I still think it's really incorrect and in a very bad way. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the correction. This is the corrected version. So it's like huh, an earlier version of this article misstated the level of his access and also the kind of malware that Iranian hackers used against some Saudi oil company. So this was the original paragraph. It said uh, he was part of a team that gained access to Michelle Obama's emails. To gain access means essentially to hack. Right, so very casual. Oh, you hacked into the former first lady's email statement. I think, like, if I was typing that statement into my my my, what I have to assume um, is a Word document on a an old ThinkPad, if I was typing that in, I would probably take a little pause, a little break, and say, hmm. Was this NSA hacker hacking the former first lady? Because that's what it reads as. I would, I would just take that little pause. Um, and obviously, he see, he's probably like, hmm, not unplussed. Here's, here's his comment that I think is just like, he, do, he does it very well. He says, at the time, she didn't seem to quite understand the significance of her commentary. And that's fire. <laughs> what it means is she told him to go pound sand, basically. And then, obviously, he had to get the support of a community to email the editor. And this is the second time in two weeks the editor of The New Yorker has had to field comments about hacking articles, right? So, why? Like, why? Right? Like, yeah, uh, as Leslie points out, that's l career limiting is, is, is another euphemism that she's using about that article. It's, and it's still career limiting, in my opinion. Uh, I think that, that that was a very rough phrase to have out there. Let's talk about another um, phrase that was in the article, which was Iranian hackers using a version of the Stuxnet worm uh, destroyed the data of the Saudi oil company. That is not true. It is something I see a lot in a lot of papers. So it's not true. And so Kim Zetter was like, hmm, that's not true. I think that's good to point out. And Nicole responded to the thread. Kim says... These are all very convoluted, easy to confuse, true. And I just think if you're confused about these sorts of things, don't write articles about them. That's kind of my thought on that. Um, sometimes everyone gets mistakes happen to everyone. These timelines are very confusing. But this is one that happens over and over, and I think it's been pretty well cleared up. Um, so uh, I think this is a really important point. You. The reason these things happen is important as well. And the reason is people want to assume that what the United States does is directly getting reflected back at it. And that is not the case, first of all. Um, the Iranians can innovate. It's also, it's weirdly racist, right? The Iranians can innovate. Let's just get over ourselves. Um, and then, you know, like... You, we could spend all day picking apart this article, various things that like are not right, have the wrong timeline, or just using the wrong terminology. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're not going to, though. So, bonus ducks. Things you might have missed. I think you should read Christina's uh, thread. Uh, this is just the beginning of the thread. Um, but I think these threads are important to read and uh, understand and internalize so that when uh, you're looking at how our community works or at how particular people work, you can take that into account. And then I really thought this paper from Nina and Benjamin was super good. It was pretty funny. It was easy to read, but it also uh, applied, um, I think, some very important concepts to wargaming. I think people underestimate the value of wargaming for looking at predictive futures. I think people also undervalue predicting the future for some reason. I think predicting the future is very useful. Anyway, go read the paper. And this paper, um, you may not 
have noticed the massive uh, advance in science that we're getting in terms of just being able to understand what animals are saying. And that's amazing, right? Like, it used to be that like, that whole world was empty to us. And now, because we have uh, microphones that can look at ultra, uh, ultra frequencies um, in, in places we can't hear, and we have deep learning techniques that can translate that essentially into English, um, you're going to be getting a, a picture of animal behavior that you probably did not have before. And it may be, um, it's one of those things where like now we all know that birds are dinosaurs, but I think it's, we're going to realize that the internal lives of an animal are much richer, much deeper than we knew or even expected. And we're going to we're going to, like 10 years from now, we're going to be able to say, oh yeah, of course you can communicate with your cat. Of course, you know, horses can tell you what's wrong with them, right? Like that's such a strange leap of activity that, that we're about to see. It's amazing. Anyway, it's a great paper. The way they do it's really, really weird. I don't think it's the right way, but it's cool. Um, uh, anyway, super fun. Go read that as well. So that, uh, that pretty much ends a bunch of stuff that did not surprise you. And I still think uh, made for a fun week, even though I spent most of the week in uh, fifth grade. So thanks so much for listening, and I'll catch you guys later.